All right, so I'm going to do a review on kinematics, on our equations, um, where they came from, graphs, and some strategies for solving kinematics problems. So one of the things we did a whole lot of was kinematics graphs, like position versus time. And when we looked at that, we might have seen something as complicated as this curvy kinematics versus or position versus time graph. And the curving indicated that the object was speeding up or slowing down or somehow changing the rate at which it was moving. In this case, the object is speeding up in the forward direction, as indicated by the uh, slope of the line getting more steep and more and more positive. The corresponding velocity versus time graph ooh, should be linear. That should be a straight line, uh, indicating a constant rate of speeding up. And that would be related to a constant positive acceleration. Or that would be a horizontal line at some positive constant value. Acceleration over here, this can be positive or it can be negative, depending on circumstances. Acceleration really is just the slope of this velocity graph. So the reason, the, the reason I know the acceleration is positive is because this slope is positive. If... We make a little change here. If the velocity versus time graph looked like that instead, the slope of that graph is negative. So that would be an example of a constant negative acceleration. Let's figure out what is this object doing. Looking at the velocity versus time graph, this line here is zero meters per second. So this is an object that has a velocity that is not zero, but over time, a velocity that approaches zero. So that object is slowing down. And it's slowing down with velocities that are up here, positive, as opposed to down here, negative. So this object is slowing down in the positive direction. If I was to graph it, I need a graph that gets less steep over time. Oh, goodness, that's disgusting. It should be much smoother than that. Um, let's see, try again. A little better. It should be curvy like that. Starting off with positive slopes, but those positive slopes are getting less and less steep. That's slowing down positive direction. Now there are other options still. We could have an object that does something like this. That object speeds up in the negative direction. Those velocities start really close to zero and then get more and more negative. That object, again, speeding up negative direction. I know that it's speeding up because the velocities here start very close to zero or at zero, and they get more and more negative. Now, the slope of this line is negative, so that would be some negative acceleration. And there's one more pretty common thing that involves speeding up or slowing down. Let me change colors again. Um, that would be, let's see, slowing down forward, speeding up forward, speeding up backwards, we still need to slow down in the negative direction, which could look like that. So I have negative velocities starting down here, and those negative velocities approach zero meters per second. That is a positive slope. The velocity versus time has a positive slope, therefore constant positive acceleration. So those are the speeding up, slowing down examples. We also have examples that are a little less exciting, like the object stands still, which means it has zero velocity, but it's not accelerating. Or an object that moves forward with constant velocity, that is supposed to be linear. The slope of a position graph becomes my velocity graph, so that would be constant positive velocity. And my slope here is zero, so that's again zero acceleration. And we could also have an object moving backwards with constant velocity. It would be constant negative velocity and again zero acceleration. So in class, we probably referred to this as the seven um, types of motion that we're likely to study standing still, moving forward in, with constant velocity, moving backward with constant velocity, speeding up forward 
speeding up backward, slowing down forward, slowing down backwards. Those are the seven things. Now, each of those seven, or all of those seven, rather, can be shown with position versus time graphs, velocity versus time graphs, and acceleration versus time graphs. And I think maybe the most useful is our velocity versus time graph. So we're going to um, focus on that. It's not working real well. Let's see. New technology. Oops. Ah! Not what I intended at all. Oh, well. So finally, we're back to writing. Velocity versus time graph is a super useful thing. And I'm going to start by looking at that. So here is a generic velocity versus time graph. And for the seven types of motion, they were all constant acceleration motions, where acceleration is either zero and remains at zero, or acceleration is non-zero and just stays constant at that value. So the result of that would be a linear velocity versus time graph. Linear with a positive slope, linear with a negative slope, or linear with zero slope. Some key details here. Acceleration is the slope of my velocity versus time graph. That's rise over run. That's an important detail. We also have an idea here of See, this is my VI, how fast I'm going in the beginning. If I trace this backwards, that's my VF. So between V initial and V final, at that halfway point, that's my average velocity. Average velocity, V bar. And one way to find it is VI plus VF over 2. And that's only true when acceleration is constant. We also have velocity being defined as the slope on a position versus time graph, so delta S over delta T. It's two different ways to do average velocity. Now we have something, um, displacement. Now a key detail here is if we maybe go to this point, some time value. The area in here represents displacement. So what you might do is like color this in and find that area. That's taking the integral. Now what I see here is a triangle and a rectangle. So I could kind of play around with that a little bit. Um, area total equals the area of a triangle and an area of a rectangle. Pardon my drawing. Now I just said area represents displacement. The area of a triangle is one half base times height. And the base is a time value. And the height of the triangle would be, let's see, from here, like a v-final, to there, or the other way around, from here up. That's the difference between v-final and v-initial. And then for a rectangle, we just have base times height, where the base is the time interval, and the height is initial velocity. So it's kind of a mess to look at. Sorry, my penmanship isn't so good with this. I could rewrite it. Um, I jumped the gun a little bit here. Let's erase. It's not the best eraser. Oh, well. Okay, so 1 half delta t and VF minus VI is also delta V, final minus initial velocity.
plus delta t plus vi or times vi. I'm going to look at this right here, delta v. I also see it up here, so I can do a substitution. Instead of writing delta v, I can write what delta v is equal to, which is a delta t. So when I plug that in, I end up with a delta t squared plus v initial t. And all of that equals displacement. That's a big equation. And it comes from our velocity versus time graph, or it can come from our velocity versus time graph. It also is related to the position versus time graph, which is a quadratic. There's a fourth equation, vf squared equals vi squared plus 2a delta s. That equation exists when you smash a couple other equations together. Substitute one of them, or solve one for time, substitute that in for another one in place of time, Math happens and you get this. So we have four main equations that should be useful to you. Usually when I list them, I list them this first, this second, this third, this fourth. Key detail is the num or equation number one is missing final velocity. So when I don't care about final velocity, that's probably the equation I'm going to pick. Equation number two up here doesn't have acceleration in it. Now, so when I don't care about what the rate of acceleration is, I'm probably going to choose some form of equation two. Equation three doesn't have any position information. So if I don't care about position, then I'm going to choose equation three. And then equation four um, doesn't have time in it. So when I don't care about time at all, I probably pick that one. Sorry, not really probably. I'm going to pick that one. It's good. It works. Okay. So now maybe a strategy on how we put this stuff together. A key detail, based on those equations, there's five things we could care about. How far something went. How fast it was going in the beginning of an interval. How fast it was going at the end of an interval its rate of acceleration during that interval, and how long that time interval took. And I make a table of five. Five things I might know. So when I read through a problem, if it gives me vi, if it gives me vf, if it gives me a, and if it asks for displacement, I would choose the equation that doesn't have time in it. That would be a vf squared equation. But if it gave me those three things and asked for time, I would choose the equation that doesn't have delta s in it. That would be my a bar equation, I think listed as equation three. Similarly, if it gave me time and acceleration and v initial, and it asked for delta s, I would choose the equation that doesn't have vf in it. And that would be my delta s equation. So that's how I choose equations, and that's how I organize my work using this thing that I'll call a table of five. Now, there is a special case. What if acceleration is zero? Well, if acceleration is zero, the v initial and the v final are the same. So our table of five collapses into a table of three which is simply how far you went, how fast you were going, and how long that time interval was. And if you know two of them, you could certainly find the third. Or if you knew these two, you could find the third. So that's pretty much it, a very quick recap of the kinematics equations um, and how I organize information, my general approach for problem solving when I'm doing a kinematics problem. Hopefully that was somewhat helpful. Hopefully. If not, it was only 14 and a half minutes of your life.